Silent Night, Deadly Night is the story of Billy Chapman. In 1971, Billy's parents brought him to see his grandfather around Christmas time. The grandfather told Billy that Santa Claus does not only exist to give presents to the good boys and girls, but to punish the wicked. He is the instrument of punishment. That evening, a convenience store robber in a Santa Claus costume hijacked the family car, assaulted Billy's mother, and killed both parents. Billy witnessed the entire crime. Only Billy and his infant brother survived. Billy grew up in a Catholic orphanage under the watchful eye of the Mother Superior. Growing up was hard, made worse by Mother Superior's teachings. She believed that not only should the good be rewarded, but the wicked should be punished. The naughty must be punished. She was a harsh, cold disciplinarian. When Billy stumbled upon two people having sex, Mother Superior did not explain what he witnessed or give Billy the child-friendly version of it, insisting only that it was wicked, that it was naughty. Mother Superior was convinced that these lessons would serve Billy well as he grew up. You will have no more trouble with him. You will see how well my methods work. As a teenager, Billy worked in a department store around Christmas. With nobody else to play the part, Billy was forced to be Santa Claus. After closing time, Billy once again witnessed two people having sex, only in this case it was not consensual. Billy did not know this, however, and only knew that whatever they were doing was naughty. Something snapped inside Billy, a combination of the trauma he received as a child and the teachings of Mother Superior created a monster, and Billy killed both the man committing the assault and the victim of the assault. He continued his murderous rampage throughout the town, all while wearing his Santa Claus costume. Billy concluded that the one person who must be punished most of all was Mother Superior. In the end, the police killed Billy while he was attempting to punish Mother Superior for what she had done to him. So, this is a very Catholic movie, right? The imagery, the characters, the themes. It does not promote Catholicism, however. The film seems to be quite critical of it. Silent Night, Deadly Night broaches the topics of punishment, penance, sin, repression, and other qualities and actions associated with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Although the word evil is commonly understood to be something that causes tremendous harm, and the word good is commonly understood to be something that prevents harm or creates benefits, evil and good within Catholicism are quite different. God is good, and only God is perfectly good. Evil in Catholicism is the absence of God or distance from God. Evil cannot exist within God. Therefore, distance from God is evil, and any action that distances oneself from God's laws is a sin. In Catholicism, a sinful act is not measured in the practical harm it may cause, but in its distance from the perfection of God. The Catholic Church may be in agreement with society about the goodness of some actions or the evil of some actions, but not for the same reasons. The Church can also be in conflict with society about good and evil based on what it perceives as closeness or distance to God. Whether or not God's laws have any practical, measurable benefit is irrelevant, because God is good and any other considerations are either meaningless or secondary to this primary consideration. A Catholic may argue that even if we, as imperfect beings, cannot measure the benefits and harms of what the Church considers good and evil actions, these actions still have reason to be good or evil. It's just that only God can understand why. We need not understand, nor is it acceptable to question this, lest we separate ourselves from God. So how does the Catholic Church decide that something is a sin anyway? The interpretation of God's laws are a matter of biblical scholarship and denominational interpretation. Take note that this is all quite reductive, as the concept of sin has been discussed and debated for thousands of years, and this is a video about a Christmas horror movie, so yeah. Nobody needs to say that this is more complicated than that. Sins have levels of severity. A mortal sin, for example, is so severe that it separates oneself from God so completely that it will lead to damnation unless the sinner confesses their sin within the sacrament of reconciliation. The sinner confesses their sins to a priest, and the priest gives a penance, or punishment, relative to the sins committed. Although the penance is performed by the sinner, it is still a punishment imposed by the Catholic Church. If separation from God is evil, and punishment brings us back into the grace of God, then punishment for sins is an inherent good. 
Because of the belief in the necessity of atonement for sins, punishment is an intrinsic value of the Catholic Church. When Mother Superior punishes the couple for having sex, she believes her actions are necessary and good. And remember, good is defined by God. She may believe that she has no choice but to punish. Punishment is necessary. Punishment is good. Billy takes these teachings to heart, and combined with his psychological trauma, becomes an instrument of Catholic punishment, dressed in the secular garb of a Christian holiday. Billy has been twisted up inside by his trauma, by the concept of punishment, and by Catholic guilt. In Catholicism, excessive guilt is not actually mandatory, nor is it explicitly taught. Catholics and other Christians sometimes mistake Catholic guilt as the byproduct of the idea of original sin, that we are all sinners due to the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. However, the concept of Adamic guilt predates Catholicism and was also later taught by Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther himself. Catholic guilt is not about original sin. Catholic guilt is actually the byproduct of doctrinal teachings about the necessity of confession and the necessity of punishment. Billy feels that he's a sinner. He has been made to feel guilty his whole life. He was unable to save his parents, even though it would be unreasonable to believe that he could have. He was taught that he was naughty as a child by Mother Superior. In the real world, an excessive amount of guilt will not necessarily transform someone into an axe-wielding maniac in a Santa Claus costume, but it can still have a deleterious effect on psychological health, including anxiety, depression, insomnia, and in some cases, suicidal ideation. Excessive guilt can also act as an enabler for compulsions related to obsessive-compulsive disorder. The feeling of carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders understandably causes a tremendous amount of psychological burden. Every action is either good or evil, something that brings one closer to God or further from God. If it's the latter, a sacrament is required or else the sinner believes that they will face eternal damnation, a permanent separation from God. Billy's transformation is cinematic and over-the-top, and it mainly exists to push the second half of the movie into a proper slasher, but it is not without a kernel of truth. In the film, Billy is the protagonist. We follow his journey. One might argue that he becomes the antagonist later in the film, but nobody specific replaces his role as protagonist. We might be too bogged down in the idea that protagonist means good guy and antagonist means bad guy, Protagonist and antagonist are merely opposing forces in the story. Therefore, Billy remains the protagonist throughout the film regardless of his actions. And the antagonist, the opposing force or obstacle in his path, is a combination of his trauma and the Catholic Church. Another connection between Silent Night, Deadly Night, and the Church is the moral panic that the film created. According to some publications, parents claimed that their objection was that this movie would traumatize children and undermine their trust in the fiction of Santa Claus. But that accusation is so preposterous on its face that it is challenging to take it as an argument in good faith. Nobody who could see a rated R movie believes in Santa Claus, and even some underage teenagers who might sneak into the theater almost certainly had long since stopped believing themselves. Children learn there is no Santa Claus around seven or eight years old. If they were really worried about their children, they wouldn't have brought them to the protests and used them as props in their crusade. So, what did the protesters really have against Silent Night, Deadly Night? They almost certainly believed that a fictional villainous Santa Claus was an inherent evil that needed to be stomped out. They believed that such a thing as evil exists that evil has weight and is measured by its distance from God. To Catholics and to these protesters, some things have a metaphysical quality of good, of being sacred. Santa Claus may be the secular representative of Christmas, but Christmas is still a Christian holiday. An offense to the church is an offense to God, and an offense to God is a great and terrible sin. Any consequences of the film, real or imagined, are irrelevant in the face of the metaphysical truth of evil. Therefore, the film is evil, distanced from God. The protesters did not have to read anything by St. Thomas Aquinas to understand the church's absolute binary of good and evil. It's implied in every lesson, every sermon, every trip to the confessional. 
Silent Night, Deadly Night, was more thoughtful than the average slasher at the time, especially in its criticisms of the religious establishment. If the protesters had actually watched the movie, they may have thought that was more offensive to their sensibilities and their faith than a killer in a Santa Claus costume, but it is doubtful that many of them even took the time to watch it. Oh well. Merry Christmas. <laughs>